Fedora 31 beta was released a few weeks ago, and I didn't really have a tremendous amount of interest. I've not been successful with Fedora in the past. It's pretty focused on specifically developers and power users. And while it does provide a complete desktop environment, in my previous attempts at using Fedora, I found that it lacked some of the creature comforts and refinements of other distributions that I'm used to, things like Ubuntu and Kubuntu and other Ubuntu flavors and other distributions in general, where they're much more focused on the a traditional sort of desktop user, end user experience, whereas Fedora seems to be more on a bend of specifically developers. And if you actually look at the Fedora about page, it'll tell you that, you know, that is really their focus. That and Libra software, so free and open source. They don't want to have any closed source, proprietary source, patent encumbered software on their systems that they release. So Things like Codex and other things that you might expect on different distributions are not going to be available by default with Fedora. There's an easy way to get around that called RPM Fusion, and I'll get to that in a second. But back to the original premise here, that when this came out, I just I thought, well, it's another Fedora. I'm really not all that interested. I tried Fedora 30. It didn't work very well for me, particularly around hardware issues with my laptop. Hybrid NVIDIA graphics was a problem. And also some of the tools I use for web development aren't available or weren't working properly. And so I just really felt like I was swimming upstream and fighting against the system to get it to work the way I needed to. And in the end, I just sort of gave up. And that's been my experience with the last several releases of Fedora. So when 31 beta came out, I just sort of looked the other way and wasn't all that interested. However, my friend Adam said to me, hey, I'm running Fedora 31 beta, particularly the workstation variant, which is the GNOME release. And it's great. It's fast. It's complete. It's got everything I need. And yes, I had to add some things from RPM Fusion. But other than that, it's been fantastic. And I thought, well, I hate to be closed minded. And I, I don't want to believe that just because I've had a bad experience in the past that that's going to translate into every future release of something being bad as well and bad meaning in this case just that it didn't work well for me there are lots of people that use fedora and use it on a regular basis and have great success with it so that to me says i must be missing something it's time to go back and take a look now, i'm not particularly interested in the gnome desktop i don't dislike it necessarily but it's just not something that fits my day-to-day -day workflow if we want to use that word or use pattern or it's just not as comfortable to me as something like KDE Plasma or Cinnamon or something like that. So in addition to the Fedora Workstation release, which is the GNOME release, they also provide spins. And Fedora spins are basically like Ubuntu flavors. In a, in, well, not basically. They're essentially the same thing as Ubuntu flavors, where they're providing different desktop environments on top of the Fedora base. So we have KDE Plasma, XFCE, LXD, LXQT, Mate, Cinnamon, and SOAS, which is, I believe, the one laptop or child uh, desktop environment that was created for that. So I've been on a bit of a Plasma and Cinema bend lately. I've got Plasma running under Kubuntu, and I thought, well, let's go ahead and take a look at the Cinnamon release and, and see how that looks. I've done that. I've done it on actual hardware on this laptop, and I'm happy to report that it worked very, very well. If you wanted the regular workstation variant, which is GNOME, you could just go to that page and you'll notice that under the ISO files, there's the beta release and you could just download it from here. I wanted Cinnamon, so I came to the spins page, grabbed the Cinnamon image, and I put it on my USB key and gave it a try. For this video, I'm just going to go through setting it up in a virtual machine just so it's more general and just run through it real quick so you can see what that looks like. So the settings for my machine... I will give it four gigs of memory because I've got 16 available, four processors because I have 12 threads available. So make sure I set my display properly all the way up for the memory and VBox SVGA with 3D acceleration enabled. And I'm going to put my ISO file onto the disk controller so that it'll boot to that. And we'll go ahead and take a look. Now, by default, Fedora includes a disk check. So what it'll do is verify the integrity of the file that you've downloaded as part of the initial booting process. I'm going to save that step here and not do it just simply for the sake of time. But if you are actually installing this on hardware, so whenever I booted it from the USB and installed it for real, I did let it run through that. It doesn't take very long and it's worth the extra peace of mind just to verify that the integrity of the file itself is good and you're not going to run into any problems there.
Okay, so what we end up with is a nice running live environment here. We've got a very nice implementation of Cinnamon. I would say that Fedora does one of the best jobs outside of perhaps Linux Mint of delivering a well-configured, well-themed, well-thought-out implementation of Cinnamon. There are certainly other distributions providing Cinnamon, but I think that they just miss the mark in some cases. I'm a bit of a purist when it comes to Cinnamon. I really like the way that the Linux Mint team has Cinnamon configured on Linux Mint, and of course that means having their themes. And so if you were to come in here and look, Fedora took the same path and has the Mint themes installed and applied. So you get the, again, in my opinion, the best looking cinnamon experience that you're going to get. Obviously it's a GTK desktop. You can apply any GTK theme. My opinion is that's what looks and works best. So why fight it, right? And I'll say that on any other cinnamon implementation that I'm doing, whether that was on the minimal Ubuntu install or OpenSUSE or Arch, all of them, I end up going back and installing the mint themes and icons anyway. So, hey, they saved me a step. All right, so from the desktop, you're basically just going to do install to hard drive, and this is going to launch Fedora's Anaconda installer. So I actually like this. I think this is nice. They tell you, hey, it's a beta. This is a beta product. Understand that you probably shouldn't be using this on like a critical system. And if you don't want to do that, then get out of here. If not, if you do, let's move forward. So pretty simple steps here. It's telling you what you need to do. Because this is VirtualBox, I'm going to let it just take the whole disk and do its automatic configuration here. If you are dual booting this like I am on my laptop, I actually came into custom and I'll do that here. Why not? And if you have other systems installed, like I happen to have Fedora here, let me just pause a second. So this is another thing I've noticed, particularly on this dark theme. It's not easy to read. So if you just come under, back under the themes and get out of this and just go to something light like that and you'll be able to see so let's just do them both and now everything is easy to see all right so i'm installing this over top of an existing virtual machine so it's showing me the fact that there are already partitions here and that i would need to free up some space in order to install this if this was a dual boot system and you had a spare partition hopefully that's the way you're going to do this you could let it still do the create automatically and it'll just use whatever free space is available. So that's actually a pretty nice touch. If you need to, you can resize things as well. So this installer is pretty powerful. You can do a lot with it. Okay, so since I'm in here and I need this space back anyway, I'm not saving these partitions. I'll just go ahead and remove these. All right, and then we can see what the default partition layout it wants to put in place is. It's a little odd that they use the LVM. I have to read up on what the point behind that is instead of a standard partition set. You also have the choice of ButterFS, but I'm just going to go with the standard partition setup and say automatic. And here you see it creates a boot partition, a root partition, and swap. On my 16 gigabyte system, so on this laptop, it actually set up an eight gig swap partition, which was kind of nice because it raised the amount of swap based on the memory that was available in the system. I still wanted more than that. So what I ended up doing was just deleting the swap partition and just having the boot and the root, and then it'll complain at me and say that you should have a swap partition. What I really want to do is add a swap file. The difference is that a partition is a fixed size chunk of your disk that's been allocated as a specific partition for swap versus a swap file, which is literally a file on your root partition that you can decide at any point needs to be resized, large or smaller. And certainly you can do that with swap partitions as well, but you'd have to use something like gparted or something like that where you're going to have to come in and probably shrink down another partition to increase the size of the swap partition. It's just really inconvenient. And if you needed to adjust it at any point, yes, it's possible, but it's just a lot more difficult. If you have a swap file, you just change it. You know, it's just a file. So if you want to make it bigger, smaller, whatever, there's very simple procedures that take literally five minutes to do and you're done.
I'm sure someone can come up with good reasons why a swap partition might be a better idea than a swap file. I haven't run into that myself, and I would much rather trade the convenience of the swap file for whatever possible practical application of a swap partition there might be. Okay, yes, complain at me about not having a swap partition. I will deal with that later. You can just say click and override. Gives you a nice summary of what it's going to do. I want to apply that. And then you have to set your root password. And so there are some other nice touches here to this installer where you can say, I want to lock this account or whether or not you want to allow the SSH login remotely with a password. Using password security for SSH generally is not a very good idea. Uh, certainly anywhere a system is exposed to the larger internet. Uh, that's just one of those attack things that people look for on a server. If you're going to use password authentication with SSH, then you should take extra steps to make sure that you lock down SSH. If at all possible, just use key-based authentication for SSH. It's just the better, safer way to do it. All right, so I have entered my root password. Click done, and I'll go ahead and create a user here as well. Get really creative. Uh, I do want to make this user an administrator, which, which basically just means they'll have access to sudo. I definitely want a password. And we've fulfilled all the requirements, so we can go ahead and click Begin Installation. This takes a little while. It's going to be 10, 15 minutes, so I won't make you watch this part. I'll just skip through into when it's done. All right, so the installation has completed. Go ahead and finish. And it just drops me back to the desktop. And at this point, I would want to go ahead and shut down. All right, and I will remove the ISO and start back up here. I know it's a simple thing, but I really like this uh, startup screen. It's a nice touch. I noticed that on the hardware install of this, that whenever I logged in the first time, it would boot me back to the login screen. I don't know if that was something peculiar to my laptop. Yeah, apparently it was, because it doesn't seem to do that here. You may experience that for yourself. Just know that this is beta and it's entirely possible that they fix that or figure it out and fix it. I also did get a couple errors. In this case, it's looking for Bluetooth, which isn't available on this machine. And that DNF Dragora, which is the graphical package manager that they use, which reminds me a lot of Synaptic. Looks like it failed as well. I did notice that once I ran the updates, that wasn't an issue any longer. So I think maybe it's just this version of the ISO file that I have. And I don't know if there's a newer one, if you download a spin, if they're putting them out on a daily basis or a routine basis. This one's only a few days old, but there are updates to run. And then after I ran those updates, everything seemed better. I am going to go ahead and run those just to get the system up to what you would expect to find once you've done the updates yourself. DNF Dragora is their graphical package manager. And I'll actually show that after I run the update from the command line. So DNF is the command line package tool. It's going to run out and check and see what there is to update. Install 14 new, upgrade 372. All right, so I finished the update and rebooted. And the last thing I wanted to show was setting up RPM Fusion. Again, this is what you're going to want to set up so that you have access to proprietary software and things like codecs, drivers, things like that. And it's very easy to set up. So if I come into the FAQ, which actually, it's probably not a bad idea to just read the FAQ to see what this is all about. It's pretty impressive to me. So this is the beta version, right? It's only been out for less than two weeks. And the RPM Fusion team already has a repository available and packages compiled and everything that you'd need to be running Fedora 31 beta. I have to say, uh, kudos to them for being so timely and uh, keeping up with things. How do I use it is really what I want. See the configuration. Now, if you are on GNOME and KDE Plasma, you can use this graphical setup option and you would just click the version of Fedora that you're on and it would download a file and then interact with the software center. And on GNOME, that's going to be GNOME Software Center and on KDE, that's going to be the Discover Software Center. Cinnamon is not, does not come with a software center on here. So what we're going to do is the command line option. 
And basically, we're just going to go ahead and copy and paste this. And if you read the command, it's always a good idea to read before you just co blindly copy and paste. So it's running DNF and it's downloading the re repo files and installing them so that you then have access to run them. So let's go ahead and paste that. Okay, do you want to do this? Yes, I do. The other thing is they give you some quick getting started sort of steps that will help with the basic stuff. So I'm guessing that most people will want this initial setup of the multimedia stuff. So it's going to give you codecs for GStreamer and things like that. And then also some of the complementary sound applications and stuff like that. So we'll start with the AppStream metadata. Go ahead and run this. And what that's going to do is allow your system to run updates against well, and I guess in this case, so that's, this is really for GNOME software and KDE Discover. So if you are using GNOME or KDE, you do want to do this app stream. For, for this in Cinema, it's really not going to do anything. We want the multimedia post install. And again, just looking at the command I'm pasting. So it's using DNF again to update these, this group. And then the last command they give here is to, like I said, sound and video complement packages. This is gonna make it so that you can play MP4 files and certain formats that are patent encumbered where they can't distribute the codecs as part of Fedora, RPM Fusion is filling that gap. And I, I noticed that before I had installed RPM Fusion that I did have an MP4 file that I couldn't play. And it basically just said, you don't have the right you know, codecs for this. There's also tainted repos, which have things like live DVD CSS for decrypting DVDs. And I'm not gonna use this here because I don't even have a DVD drive in my laptop. So it's kind of pointless. Okay, so this gives you the capability of having, like I said, playing media formats and then having access if you wanted to install NVIDIA drivers or other proprietary drivers. RPM Fusion is going to give you all of that. If you have any questions about what it's providing, like I said, this FAQ is a great place to start. There's really no reason for me to give a grand tour of the desktop here. Again, this is Cinnamon. The thing that I'll say about Fedora is that they're pretty judicious in the packages they provide. So they're not really overloading your system with hundreds and hundreds of applications. They really pick sort of the one for everything approach where you've got a browser a messenger, email. I think the strength of Fedora in this case is much like Ubuntu, where it doesn't matter what desktop environment you prefer, there's an option for you. And so you should be able to grab a spin if you're not into GNOME and try out any of them that interest you. And again, hopefully this has, works out as well for you as it has for me. I appreciate you taking the time to watch the video. It's important to me that you find these useful and interesting and helpful and all of that sort of stuff. So if you have any comments, feedback or anything like that, please leave them below. I wish you a good day and thank you for coming and I will see you in the next video. Take care, everyone.